Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today to discuss what's new in Vault 2023. And uh, we are going to briefly review what's new in 2022.1 and 2022.2 as well, because those updates will have been folded into 2023. And if you haven't applied those updates in your environment just yet, um, you know, they will be in 2023 for you. And you could apply the 2021 or 2022.1 and .2 updates to your current environment if you weren't quite ready to go up to 2023 just yet, especially on the, say, the CAD client side. Uh, so again, feel free to ask questions. Even as we go, I'll be keeping an eye on the question pane. Um, and I may address questions uh, as we go if they fit in context for what we're discussing. Uh, otherwise, I'll be answering questions um, some questions at the end of the presentation. So let's start with what was new or is new, depending on if you've applied it, in the 2022 uh, mid-year updates. There were some uh, significant updates, especially in the dot one release for 2022. Um, the one feature that I think um, seems pretty simple, but I don't think it's quite as simple as as some people thought, was just adding the copy design command to the vault uh, add-in in Inventor. Um, you know, it's it's absolutely possible that you may need to open up an assembly to verify that is the one you want to copy and maybe what you might need to copy before you copy it. Um, and so now you can do all that inside Inventor, open up an assembly, review it if you need to, and then choose to execute the copy design from the vault interface within Inventor itself. Um, another huge addition in 2022.1 was the addition of markups to the uh, thick client. Um, now there was a further enhancement in 2023 to that, um, and so we'll see all that together here in a minute. Um, but if you're familiar with the uh, the vault thin client, um, if you've messed with that at all and the new fancy viewer uh, that you get while using it, um, the this fancy browser viewer um, was added. You can use that in 2022 Vault now if you've got the latest updates. Um, so that can be a huge improvement in the viewing experience, um, even inside the thick client. Um, SSL configuration, um, most environments that I've worked on, actually I think with the exception of maybe one out of literally hundreds, um, do not use SSL, like secure HTTP is another way to say it, um, for their internal you know, vault configuration. I think part of that might have been because it could be tricky to set up and maintain in the past. Um, it got easier to do. Um, with an update in 2022. Um, better support for drawing uh, inventor model states on the drawing side were added. Inventor model states were a great addition, um, significant change, but a great addition to inventor. Um, but that also really necessitated some support for those in vault. Um, some support was added in 2022 and um, I think there may have been some improvements to that in 2023. Um, we'll see as we go through. Um, and then some other minor UI things, adding you know, the advanced search capability to certain dialogues in Vault that didn't have it before, right? So um, in most dialogues, um, you could do a quick search or look at your saved searches or shortcuts, um, adding um, the advanced search for certain dialogues like selecting files in the copy design interface or adding attachments or purging. Um, so just, again, taking advantage of the existing powerful search behavior in Vault um, and making it easier to take advantage of that. Um, there were fewer updates, um, I would say, in the dot two release. Some interesting ones, um, though. Um, some better integration with Active Directory in terms of 
um, mapping um, Active Directory information to uh, display name. Um, also, making it possible to import attributes um, so that now that with 2022, we could add custom attributes to user accounts. If you've got dozens or hundreds of users and you wanted to, you know, update the attribute value for all of those users, um, you can now import via an Excel spreadsheet to do that update. So it could be much simpler to get, you know, mass edits of user attributes now. Um, again, some more enhancements to model states in terms of how properties compliance is assigned because you really have sort of one primary document and sort of sub documents. It's kind of, it's not really transparent how that all works on the inventor side of things. Um, but there could be issues prior to that to update with calculating properties compliance. Um, so that was cleaned up a bit in the dot two update. Um, and then some more thin client enhancements in the dot two update for 2022 as well. Downloading DWFs or the file, which I know that um, the inability to do that caused some folks some grief um, earlier in the release cycle for 2022. Um, but that's now available in 2022. So if you're still on 2022 vault um, and um, you're not ready to go to 2023 just yet, um, just note there are some enhancements that have been added. So if you have not applied these updates yet, um, it's something that should be relatively straightforward to do. Uh, on the server side, applying an update is going to require database migration. So it's always the kind of thing that you want to test um, and have a good you know, recovery plan. Um, but it wouldn't necessitate a full update, say, of your, your CAD software or anything to get some of these enhancements. Okay, so let's move on now to what's new in the actual 2023 release. So again, those updates I just discussed, they'll be here as well. Um, but of course, 2023, some uh, big ticket additions have been made, um, some of which are really, I think, game changing in terms of how you put Vault to use. Um, and as usual, we can divide these updates into a few different categories based on who they impact the most. Um, authors, you know, those people especially that are using CAD applications to, to create data and, you know, manage that data in the vault. Um, of course, our administrators, um, we saw some great enhancement to administration in the 2022 release. Um, 2023 adds something called Vault Gateway, which is, frankly, fantastic. Um, we're going to see a good look at that today. That can make it um, much easier from a, just an infrastructure standpoint to provide access to Vault um, for people that are not even on the network, let alone in the building. Um, and then, of course, some changes to participants. Um, I think especially with the new Thin Client, uh, in 2022, um, a real push has been made to improve how people who don't author, who just need to read or just view the data, how they interact with Vault. Um, and um, we've got even more uh, enhancements in 2023 to make that experience even better. So let's start with authors. Um, and this is a big one. Uh, I think is is great. It's a feature that I've been looking for in Vault for a long time. Um, I don't know how long ago it was the first time I was asked if um, Inventor could do this, um, and then by extension Vault really work with the data. Um, but I know it was years ago. Um, and so Inventor now. And I admittedly don't get to spend as much time with Inventor these days as I used to. So I don't recall if these were added this year or last year and a prior year. But 
um, the concept of instance properties. Uh, so with Autodesk Inventor, if you have an assembly where you've got multiple occurrences of the same component, you may need to or want to specify properties specific to a given occurrence in the context of a specific assembly. Uh, now, this is, uh, I think, most common with purchased items, uh, especially in electrical assemblies. And the, the inventor cable and harness environment has had support for this forever um, because of that real need. But, you know, something as simple as a device tag. So if I have four pumps on a skid and I want to capture in, uh, in my bill of materials, let's say, or in some sort of list representing the bill of materials or, or the model, if I want to capture and assign a unique tag to each of those devices, um, if they're the same inventor part or assembly, um, I can't associate that information with the referenced document, right? Because it has its own um, set of I properties and those I properties are the same for every instance in every assembly. Um, so what instance properties in inventor allow you to do um, is in the context of a specific assembly, so skid A, I could assign independent values, say a tag, to each of these occurrences. So they are otherwise identical. They're four pumps exactly the same, but I want to tag, give them each a unique tag for documentation, maintenance purposes, etc. So Inventor can do that now. All right, so if we take a look at Inventor, um, I have an inventor assembly up here with, um, you know, a seven different, uh, seven identical, I should say, sub-assemblies um, with, um, so that's all the same, you know, assembly, you know, part number 33. And I would like to be able to provide a unique identifier for each one of these. Let's say, again, let's say a tag um, for maintenance, tracking, et cetera. So it's straightforward to do that within Inventor. Um, right? I can add a custom um, I property here. So we could call this, you know, device tag. Um, and then I can set that as, um, an instance property um, for each of those guys here. So you can see on the position side how I've I've already done that here, right? So we could we could say that this was, um, you know, add like create an instance property like so, um, and then I could I could then fill out you know a unique tag for for each of those devices. So in this case, you know, I just assigned a position to each of these guys for this assembly. Um, and what's new in 2023 is that in Vault, I should say, is Vault can now understand um, that, that instance property and actually display it inside, um, inside, uh, the vault inside the vault item master because that's really where this applies, right? It's it's a bill of material, um, and so um, you know we need to to be able to maybe capture and display that in vault, send it downstream somewhere, right? And we can do that, you know, now inside Inventor, right? So you can see um, how I could fill out, you know, this is you know like whatever property here, you know, we could fill in this information like so. Um, and so for this instance, so it's still the same inventor assembly, but it's a unique identifier for that occurrence. Right. So I've added that to this assembly. I'm just gonna go ahead and save and, and check this guy in now. Now, 
in order to display these things inside the vault, um, there are some requirements. Uh, so one of the more important ones is to make sure um, that you have your inventor bill of materials um, sorted and sorted's the wrong word. That's more, that's not the right word. Um, make sure this is how you want it to be, right? So if you want to display a structured bill of materials and manipulate that, um, especially if the structured bill of materials um, view is enabled, um, you need to make sure that you review your part number merge settings. Um, and this is something that you will need to review regardless if you're using instance properties in Inventor. Um, because if I indicate that merge, that instance row should be merged, um, these are going to stack back up. You know, 1033, all of these 1033s references, they're going to stack back up and you're going to get varies in the device tag and the, and the position here. So you do need to make sure an inventor, if you're using the structured view, that your merge settings are such that you can actually see these individual instance properties. Otherwise, this information is not going to get communicated to Vault at all, as far as I know. So that's something you need to make, make sure you've got worked out on the inventor side. Um, now, on the Vault side, there's some other things that need to get done. So we're looking at the Vault 2023 client here. Um, you do need to create a mapping for instance properties, but you do need to take some care in how you're doing this um, because you have one chance when you're creating the property to specify it as a bill of materials row. Right? So this is a fundamentally different type of property from our vault user, other vault user defined properties. Notice when I check this box, I can't assign it to any categories. That's because this is a, while we're using the same interface to specify this information, it really is a different animal from other user defined properties. It doesn't make any sense, or at least we can't have associated with categories one of these bill of material rows properties. It's really a, a working of bills of material. It doesn't have anything to do with documents necessarily. Um, it really is a row of a bill of materials is going to have this kind of property. Now, if you don't check this and you press OK, at that point, you have created a vault user defined property. So you can't go back and modify this and check that box again. It won't be available. So that's why you do need to say right away before you hit OK or anything, don't forget, check this box. And now this is a bill of materials row property. And we do still need to map this to an inventor instance property. Right. So it would still be an inventor file. Um, we would go and find that assembly, right? This is uh, instance props.iam is the, the name of my assembly here. Right. So we need to import this from our vault. And then our device tag should show up like any other custom property like you see here. And of course, Vault has no control over this. This is always going to extract it from CAD. Inventor owns this information. That's where it would need to be maintained. Right. And so now if we go and look at this component. I already had an item created for this earlier. Um, but if I update this item, we can see on the bill of materials, here's that position property that I already had. So you can see that each, even though these are all the same item number, they are now broken out in this bill of materials showing their individual uh, instance property. And this is where I could customize my view. 
it's going to be a bill of materials field, just like item quantity. Device tag should be here. You can see, even though I didn't have that property assigned before I checked in, that data was still available as a result of the check-in from Inventor. So all I had to do was create the property and map it, and even something that had already been checked in with that information, it's there now. So this is can be incredibly powerful. Um, again, if you need to propagate information like this downstream to other business systems, ERP, MRP, PLM, et cetera. Um, now, just some other notes about how to make sure you actually can get at this data um, inside uh, inside Vault, right? Because Inventor is only half of, of the equation. Getting it assigned inside Inventor, you know, is certainly um, important. Um, but you've got to be able to see it inside Vault to take advantage of this new behavior and actually put it to use uh, within the Vault. So some other notes about that. Um, it's not enough just to make sure that the inventor part is right and that you've mapped the property. There are some uh, vault level settings for how uh, bombs are extracted. Um, and it really depends um, on whether or not you have the structured view enabled for the assembly. So I think in general, you're gonna to wanna to pick a direction whether or not you use the structured view. In my opinion, if you're using items in Vault, you're gonna to wanna to use structured bills of material inside Inventor and make sure your Inventor bomb structure by using the designators like Phantom, Inseparable, Purchased, to make sure that your structured bomb on the Inventor side looks like what you would wanna see it in Vault. That also now would include your instance properties. Um, so there's a setting in Vault Pro. Let me get my admin window up here. So configure settings for bomb rows, right? This one is the key to make sure instance properties are available in Vault. Group bomb rows as per the design bomb. Um, if you uncheck this box, it's my understanding that regardless of all the rest of the configuration, Vault's gonna do the grouping of rows and it's always gonna group by part number. And so all of those individual instances on the bomb are gonna collapse into one row because they have the same part number. So you're gonna wanna make sure that box is checked. But then depending on how your inventor um, is configured, um, again, you need to make sure that if the structured bomb is enabled that you are not merging instance rows. Because if again, if you leave that box unchecked, inventor is never going to transmit the instance property data um, in the first place. Um, and then of course, um, you've got to add the vault UDP itself, the user defined property as a column in the bomb view, right? The data may be there, but if you're not actually showing um, that on your bill of materials tab, you won't be able to see it, right? Um, and in fact, if both of these go away, um, okay, it still does break them out, right? So you you might notice something weird here, right? And this may be, it may be that you don't want this behavior and someone has added instance properties to their assembly for some reason, and you really do want all of these to be collapsed. That's where you would need to change that other setting. Um, because the fact now that there, there are instance properties for this, we've told Vault we care about them and we wanna group our bomb rows by the CAD definition, we're gonna get this behavior. Right, so these are no longer rolling up, um, even though they have the same part number, because there are instance properties here behind the scenes. Um, and so we had one question about this, do instance properties work? 
um, in Vault without using items in Vault Pro. It's my understanding that there's no way uh, to get to those. There's nothing here. You do see this CAD bomb tab. Um, this CAD bomb tab is uh, uh, an artifact of the Vault data standard. So if we look at that, um, this is um, the Vault data standard um, attempting to um, to view this bill of materials. And you can see, I do actually see like position here and it did break these out into individual um, rows, but each of these rows has all of the instance data sort of concatenated together, um, right? And so, and I don't even recall adding data like this. And so, again, this CAD bomb is is a data standard construct. Um, if you don't have the data standard installed, you wouldn't see this at all. Um, and I don't believe there's any way um, to see the instance properties um, because there's no mapping between the document itself. Like these would be the properties for this document. We we can't see the bill of materials for this assembly unless we actually extract it into item records in the bomb. Um, so as of right now, at least, um, you might think you could use this CAD bomb tab to do it, but it doesn't seem to be effective. And I'll just say one more note, if you're not using the bill of materials behavior um, in Vault Pro, um, especially people that have been using Vault for a long time, um, in the distance, distant past, I would say in a lot of cases, it seemed like maybe it was too much work to manage with not enough benefit. Um, I'm seeing more and more people implement the bill of materials behavior um, and the item master in Vault Pro just because of what it can do for you in general. Um, the fact that it can make getting to a complete engineering bill of materials so much easier than say, starting with an inventor bomb and exporting that to Excel and then, you know, digging through, um, you know, your ERP to fill out part numbers on the spreadsheet um, or maintaining a bunch of virtual components. Um, you can do all of that much more easily inside Vault Professional um, in terms of getting to a complete engineering bill of materials um, because you can manipulate and add to that bill of materials within the Vault from the Vault Item Master as opposed to retyping information in all the time. And then once you get to a bill of materials, say a completed bill of materials inside of a Vault, um, you can then very easily um, save that information out to a comma delimited file. It becomes much easier to integrate that with another business system like ERP or PLM um, because this is much more easily accessible data than having it buried inside of an inventor document. So um, if you're struggling today with your engineering bills of material and getting to that complete engineering bomb and passing it down um, to the next folks that need it, take a good look at Vault Pro's item master. Um, and one more question that came in, how much of this will work in Vault Workgroup? Um, right now, none of it because Vault Workgroup does not provide item master behavior. I, the item master is a function of Vault Pro. Um, but um, I will just say, ask that question again in a month or two and um, might be able to uh, answer that question a little differently in the next few months, maybe. Um, okay. So let's move on to the next 
topic here. Um, so that to me was one of the big ones, the instance behaviors on the bomb. Um, there's another big one coming up. Um, most everything else are, are a lot of the rest of it is I, th I would say nice to have stuff. Um, this could be a big one if you use AutoCAD with Vault. Um, we already had this in Inventor, the ability to show details inside of, of Inventor. Um, so, you know, we can show the details pane inside Inventor. It's, it's very easy on the Vault tab. Um, you can show details and basically you get your history. Essentially the same view you have in your Vault Thick client in terms of uses and where used information. Um, you can um, show that inside your Inventor interface now. Um, we can do that in AutoCAD now too. You get to it a little bit differently. There's no show details button up on the Vault ribbon, but if you display your XREF palette, which generally you should have open if you're using Vault with AutoCAD because that's where you see your file status, um, you can right click and show details. And so you get a floating palette that you can dock you know, with that same information, history uses where used information. Um, and if this drawing is associated with a, an item in Vault, you can even look at bill of materials information here as well. So basically that the, the item that this is associated with. So that's a really nice thing again, spending more time in your CAD application and less to no time at all in the standalone Vault client. Um, user interface changes. Um, this one was a big one for me um, because of dark mode. So I intentionally started uh, the presentation with Vault 2023 client in what's now called classic view. Um, this looks essentially identical to what it did in 2022 and prior, um, but it is now straightforward for you to, to apply uh, one of these new themes. We have a, a new light theme, which you know we light colored, but new a new look. Um, I prefer dark mode, so I'm gonna turn that on right now. And it works really well. It kind of does it dynamically. And now just like that, it's mostly the same. The buttons might look a little bit different. We've got fewer like 3D elements. It's more of a flat style that seems to be what's in today. Um, but it also looks a whole lot more like the thin client, right? So we're kind of getting toward a, a sort of more unified user experience regardless of the environment you're using. You just might have different buttons, um, but we have you know similar fonts now, more similar icons. So we're sort of homogenizing the experience regardless of how you get into Vault, right? So I love dark mode and everything. Um, I spend a lot of time in front of the computer um, and um, I think this really, um, really helps on iStream for me personally. So if you're a fan of dark mode, we've got it in Vault now. We had it in Inventor, I think, starting last year or the year before. So now, you know, you can have nice reduced iStream regardless of the application you're using. Um, maybe a minor thing, although I know I have I've had a real need for this in the past, um, especially like in the change state dialogue, I wanted to be able to show some other properties so that I could make uh, a more informed decision about what I was changing. Um, you can now customize views um, in things like the change state dialogue or change revision or pack and go. So a lot of dialogues before where you basically just had like name state definition or you know a predefined set of columns to choose from, um, you now should be able to customize and add custom columns. Um, and as far as dark mode available in workgroup, I think it's available in workgroup. I'm not sure why it wouldn't be, because as far as I know, the the UI itself is, you know, 99% the same across the different products. Um, Basic has some significantly different status icons, but otherwise, you know, the core application itself is pretty similar. So I don't know why it would not be available in uh, in work group, but that's not something that I've personally tested. All right, so um, that's 
everything for the author bucket. Now, some of these other things certainly impact authors, but these are very specific to the authoring experience, right? Um, customizing, you know, views in other dialogues, dark mode for sure, you know, UI enhancements, instant prop, instance properties. Um, now let's move on to some administrative changes. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, I know um, for certain applications, this has maybe caused some issues in the past for certain folks. Um, for as long as I can remember, um, we've had this setting in Vault called Enforce Restriction for Check-in of Design Files. I don't know if it's always been called that, but the basic idea is, um, in theory, I should not be able to um, grab a drawing or an inventor model, right? So this, say this part right here, um, I shouldn't be able to just drag and drop, especially as a user, an inventor file, you know, into this folder, um, right? Um, because especially with things like inventor files, there are I properties associated with that. If it's an assembly, there might be a bill of materials. And in order to communicate all of the information, file relationships, et cetera, those design files really need to be added in from the authoring applications add-in, right? So that's why this setting exists. So you can't just randomly drag and drop files and end up with a bunch of broken links. Um, but in 2023 now, we do have the ability to ease those restrictions um, if it makes sense to do so. So um, this also, by the way, gives you a nice list of all the default restrictions if you weren't sure. But you can see here now, here are all of the default file type restrictions, and it's based on file extension. Um, so if you decide, you know what, we don't really index any properties for drawings, we never use XREFs, we just want to get these drawings in the vault, and we want to make it easy for people to do so. So let's go ahead and let them drag and drop into the vault client. You could uncheck that box so that DWGs could be added to the system, but maybe for your inventor users, they couldn't do that, right? So now you can independently control um, for each of the applications that that vault is really aware of, right? So that does include like AutoCAD architecture, AutoCAD electrical, uh, Creo, MicroStation, SolidWorks. So this is aren't just Autodesk applications, but basically any authoring application um, that would have an add-in where there really is value in using that add-in, you're probably going to see an entry here. And so you could certainly now individually take these off, but you can also add your own. So if for some reason you want to prevent certain file types from being ever added to your vault, this would be a way to do that. Um, if maybe you've written your own custom authoring application um, and you want to make sure that um, people use that application to add the files, um, you could potentially do that. Um, this will keep them from adding those files to the vault through the client itself, right? So you could just type in whatever that extension would be. And now I could not drag a file, whatever dot one, two, three into the vault, unless I was, you know, had the right permission to turn that setting off. So, um, an interesting addition, I could definitely see where it would have some value. Um, so you can't outright remove the defaults from the list, but you can turn them off. Um, this is another interesting one, the ability to apply colors to lifecycle states. Um, so you'll always have this little symbol, but it's just a new column that could be added um, to you know, our components, right? So we've got some files here in certain states. Um, one of these now is called the state glyph, right? So I could put this say right next to the, the file type. And so now we can see this, yes, this file is controlled by lifecycle and the green is work in progress. And you can control what those glyphs, what those colors are when you're manipulating your lifecycle definitions, right? So we could come in here, see how they're all over here. Um, and you've got this edit right here. So if we wanted, you know, work in progress to be red and release to be green, 
right? Um, now I don't recall what life cycle this guy is in. It is in our flexible release process. There we go. So now work in progress is red, released is green. So interesting and a way to potentially shrink the UI a little bit, right? So if you have a bunch of stuff up here and you don't necessarily want the word state, you could just have it as a glyph now if you'd like, which is interesting. Um, now the big one for admins uh, in my mind is Vault Gateway. This is huge. Um, so this is, I believe it's just an entitlement for anyone who uses Vault Pro. Um, I was able to just turn it on and it is incredibly easy to configure. Um, the basic idea is this. You have your company network, and you could be in the office, you could be at home on a VPN, um, but you'd still be inside that firewall. And traditionally, you never want to expose your vault server, the server that you maintain, directly to the internet. Um, there's just too much risk associated with it. So that can cause a problem if, let's say, your company doesn't have a VPN set up, or if you've got people using mobile devices um, that can't connect to your VPN, um, or even, say, a, a supplier um, or a customer that you want to you know, grant access to some little bit of your vault. Um, prior to 2023 in Vault Gateway, you had no choice really. To be safe, you had to expose the vault through a VPN, which really isn't exposing it at all. But now Vault Gateway gives you another option. So Vault Gateway is a way that you can use Autodesk Forge and Autodesk's you know, literally decades of experience in terms of security and stability to expose your vault to users that are not connected to your VPN, right? So basically, no matter where you are in the world, um, whether you're on a VPN or not, whether you're on a mobile device or not, um, you could go to a special server URL, and Autodesk will field that request, securely interact with your on-premise vault, um, and then pass that data back to the user. Right, so Autodesk will play the middleman here for security purposes. Um, and it is extremely easy to set up. Um, I'm gonna call it my ADMS console here. Um, I already have one set up, but essentially you go to manage your vault gateway. And then you just, to configure, now I won't be able to configure one here fully because uh, I already have one set up, right? But you pick the region it should go into. The last I looked at this, we had US East, Northern Virginia, and Ireland. Um, so where this gateway is located, this is gonna be on a cloud server somewhere, where this gateway is located is gonna have some impact on performance. Um, but ultimately, you specify an Autodesk ID that is, um, administrates a uh, an Autodesk account team um, and that has a vault professional license associated with it. And that's really it, unless you're using a proxy server. Um, you wait 20, 30 seconds and then you've got a URL and then within another couple of minutes, you can start using it. Um, it was incredibly easy for me to set up every time that I tried it. Um, so from a, from a let's share our vault data carefully with people outside of our company perspective or off of our network perspective, you're, ne you're never going to get anything easier than what vault gateway gives you. It's, it's just dead simple. Um, now there is performance impact, right? There's no question about that. So, and just to kind of show how this, how this works, um, over here on the left, I have uh, a vault client connected to a server on the same computer. This is as fast as it's ever gonna get in terms of downloading files. If you were working on a local network, say to a server that was down the hall and your latency was very low and you were on a gigabit switch, 
it would be a little bit slower, but not crazy slower, right? So, but this is this is as as close as it as fast as you could possibly get. And I just want to show you how long it takes to maybe get an assembly. Over here on the right, I'm logged into my Vault Gateway server from the same computer, right? So I'm just going to get this assembly, right? So notice it does take a little bit longer. You know, we're at like five, six seconds for it to come up with this dialogue. Um, I'm getting all of the children, their 91 files. So I'm just going to press OK. And now it's going to start up. I'm going to do the same thing over here. Right? Notice it came up in maybe a third of the time. And I'm going to press OK. And now we can see how long it takes to get this one. Um, and it couldn't update the file references, but it got all of the files um in less than a second <laughs> right so local it was super 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 fast the gateway we're still downloading right now part of this is because i'm in california the gateway server is in virginia so there's latency there um that has more of an impact i would say on the the usability I hesitate to use that word because it's still very usable, but it's not as smooth, right? As if you were, if you were, again, this where I just click on a folder and it's right there, right? Yep. This is, I, I have so many versions of Autodesk software on this computer. I get this all the time. Um, but it took, you know, 60 seconds, maybe a little longer to get the files here versus about a second um, locally. So yeah, it took longer for sure. Some other tests we've done, it's usually maybe two to three times longer to get files through the gateway. So it's not the kind of thing that you just, yeah, let's turn on Vault Gateway and everybody use Vault Gateway. It's not necessarily, especially if you can, um, if you can securely make a connection faster, a faster connection to your Vault server, especially like if it's in on a VM in in your data center down the hall, <laughs> um, you're going to want to connect directly to the Vault server. Um, but if you've got a mobile device, if um, if your VPN configuration is such that all the traffic is going through some other remote data center anyway, and it's all clogged up because everyone has to work from home anymore, um, the gateway can still provide um, good connectivity while bypassing the VPN and doing so securely. Um, and I think its real benefit would be for things like um, Vault Mobile, which if you're not aware, Vault Mobile is available for both Android and iOS. Um, as of late last week, Vault Mobile did not support 2023 just yet. Um, it's my understanding it's slated for sometime in May. Um, but I think that's the, killer app for Vault Gateway is using it with Vault Mobile um, because then you can be out on a work site. You need to look up something in Vault. You call up your iPad, log in using Vault Gateway, and you don't have to worry about any VPN, any connectivity, whatever. As long as you can get to the internet, you can get to your Vault. Um, and a question, what is the cost of Vault Gateway? As far as I can tell, it's part of your Vault professional entitlement. Um, I don't I don't know how, um, but it seems like it's just if you're paying for Vault Pro, Gateway is just something you can choose to use at no additional cost. I think worst case, it would be the cost of another Vault Pro license because the, the service user, when you, when you set up Vault Gateway, um, it's my understanding that when you configure Vault Gateway, the, the service account user has to have a license of Vault Professional assigned. Right. Um, and I believe, I don't know if it's available. There's there's scattered information about Vault Gateway in the Vault Help. Um, it's my understanding um, an FAQ um, is going to be released sometime soon. I'm not sure um, if it's available just yet. Um, but I expect there will be here in the next couple few weeks, I would guess, sometime soon. We'll probably have a concise FAQ for things like um, security, 
licensing. So as an example, we set this up as a test on, on uh, AWS. We created a, a vault server. We enabled vault gateway. Um, I could not connect to that. Um, I could not connect to the server directly from my vault client, but I could still connect to it via vault gateway. So um, I know just enough about networking and security to get myself in a heap of trouble. That's why I try to stay away from it <laughs> most times. Um, but it was one of those things that just worked. Um, so another question about Gateway, does it have, uh, does Vault Workgroup? Vault Workgroup does not. I believe Vault Gateway is simply a, a function of Vault Pro. Um, does it require name users on Autodesk.com to use? That's a great question. When you log in via Vault Gateway, um, I believe it works with either Autodesk ID or Vault logins. It does not work with Windows logins because you're not necessarily on the domain. Um, another thing is if you use your Vault account to log in, um, you must have a strong password to log in um, using an, a Vault account with Vault Gateway or it's not gonna let you, right? This is they're enforcing a security thing. Right, so I can use Vault Gateway with my Autodesk ID, or I could use it with a Vault account, but that Vault account must have a strong password or you're gonna get this message. Okay, so we're running, we're getting close to the top of the hour, and I think I've addressed all of the questions as they come in, so we don't have too much to do there. Um, this is a, a note, this is something that everyone who uses Vault Basic needs to be aware of, starting with 2023. Now, technically prior to 2023, it's my understanding that there was a way, a way technically, not legally, but technically, you could deploy Vault Basic to a computer for a user that didn't have a CAD license. So if you install the CAD software and, and you could get Vault Basic on there. Maybe somebody could still use Vault Basic, even though they didn't have a CAD license assigned to them. And for years and years, people have said Vault Basic is free, but that's not true. Vault Basic is associated, you're entitled to use Vault Basic if you have a CAD license associated uh, to you, right? If you own a CAD license, that CAD license can use Vault Basic, but it really is tied to the CAD license. And Autodesk is now enforcing that um, starting with 2023. Um, if you want to use Vault Basic, you still have to, uh, to sign in with an Autodesk ID, not necessarily to Vault, but to the, cat, the, to the Vault application. You know how you know, I'm logged in here with my Autodesk ID. If you're gonna use Vault Basic, you still gotta sign in now. And that Autodesk ID must have a qualifying CAD application uh, license associated with it. Right, and they've expanded what counts as part of this too, right? So basically, if you own any manufacturing type authoring application aside from Inventor LT or AutoCAD LT, you can still use Vault Basic. But if you, as a user, if you have an Autodesk ID, if you do not have a CAD application associated with that Autodesk ID, you're not gonna be able to use Vault Basic. Um, so, if, if you were using Vault in this way before, be aware that when you upgrade to 2023 Vault, if you're using BASIC, you won't be able to, to do that anymore. Um, you really should not have been doing that in the first place if you were doing it. Um, this is just now being enforced. This only applies to Vault BASIC. With Vault Workgroup or Professional, you have a license and so it, that doesn't matter. Now we're really running short on time. This is an important part, but I wanna make sure um, we understand um, markups have gotten very interesting now in the thick client. Um, so in 2022, um, one of the updates, we were granted the ability to use the thick client um, to view and use this, you know, forge viewer. Um, or large model viewer inside the thick client. Um, and I believe we could even do markups, but you would have to save them as a JPEG and do whatever. Now, 
in 2023, um, we have this markup panel. And so I can do a markup inside the thick client and choose to save it as data. And it's actually going to add it to this browsing panel. And this is persistent. It's not a part of the CAD file. It's not a modified DWF. It's just extra data stored in the system so that the next time I or anybody goes and looks at this and looks at the markups, that's going to be there and going to be consistent. Right? So that I just added. So anyone can come in here. They could delete it. They could rename it. Right? And so this is now a fantastic way to collaborate inside the thick client. The same behavior works on the ECOs. So before this, where we had to maybe, um, you could technically do markups with an ECO, but it was getting harder and harder because it used design review and there were registry issues and all that kind of stuff. The markup workflow, especially with ECOs inside the thick client now, I don't know it could be any easier because the markup history will just be there. And it's there like everywhere that this file record appears, whether it's here on the view tab looking at this, if it's associated with an ECO, et cetera, that's all there. Um, now you'll see um, what looks like the thin client and that markup browsing panel inside the thick client. Um, this presentation I'm using, this PowerPoint I'm using came from Autodesk, these images were already there. I don't think as of right now that this markup browsing panel is in the thin client just yet. Um, I've tried to find a way to turn it on. Um, it doesn't show up here. Um, you don't have the ability to save markups to the browsing panel in the thin client. I looked in the help and it mentioned um, something about um, in the thin client, um, you can only save a snapshot of the markup downloaded as a PNG file. So the markups don't work quite the same way in the thin client. Um, but you can still do thin client markups and save as an image, um, as a PNG. Um, this makes me wonder if something like this is coming for the thin client. I think it would be a fantastic addition, but I can't find a way to turn this. If nothing else, I can't find a way to turn this panel on in the thin client. It might be missing something. It's still early days in the release, but um, I haven't been able to find it. Okay. Um, and one last thing. Inventor read-only mode. This was a real problem with Vault Office. Um, if you were using Vault Office to provide viewing capability, especially in conjunction with Inventor read-only mode, um, depending on whether or not there was a DWF of the file created, you might have real trouble viewing the model data with Inventor read-only mode and Vault Office. It was just a weird quirk of the software. With 2023 now, you can explicitly say, um, when I'm viewing inventor files, always use inventor read-only mode um, to remove that little quirk. So if you were having trouble with that before in Vault Office in 2023, that trouble will go away. And also note now, if you use the cloud-based software deployments, you can choose to deploy inventor read-only mode only. So this is a way you can get inventor read-only mode on client computers without installing the full inventor suite and confusing people with licensing or anything like that. All right, and so that's it. And it is now the top of the hour. Um, I see one more question. If you've got other questions, please feel free to, to add those in right now. Um, just, I think there's a whole amazing slew of improvements in 2023. I think it's, so far it's been a good release. I think it's gonna be a great release over time. Um, and don't forget, if there's something that you want to be added to the software you didn't see here, um, join the feedback community. You can participate in betas and make your voice heard. Um, and you can always go to the idea station. Um, many of the enhancements we get year to year now come from the idea station. So if there's something you want, go add it, go find something and upvote it, get your friends to upvote it, um, and it will bump that up into the priority um, in terms of development. All right, so um, again, we addressed most of the questions uh, as we were going. I see one question here. Um, if I use a part in an assembly and assign it an instance tag, that tag is then unique to that assembly's bomb 
And if the same part is used in another assembly, it can be assigned a new tag and or same tag ID with different value. Yes. So again, to, to reiterate, um, the idea of instance properties in Inventor um, are that you can have an occurrence of an assembly. Let's get back up here to where one has. So this is an occurrence of this assembly 33. It has a unique value. This is still the same assembly document, but it is another occurrence. It also has a unique value. And if I put this same assembly into another inventor assembly, if I, if I place this into another assembly, this information is gonna be nowhere in that new assembly. It can have its own unique information. It could be the same, right? But it, the idea of these instance properties, this property is unique for this occurrence in this assembly. It's incredibly powerful if you need to differentiate identical components based on things like tag. And again, Vault Pro can now capture that information for use downstream.